And welcome to East Dropping at the Movies. I'm Mike. And I'm Ozzy. And we're talking about The Suicide Squad today. Not Suicide Squad, but its sequel. Its first real sequel, I suppose. So Suicide Squad came out in 2016 and went down incredibly badly with everyone except for you. You said it was colourful and imaginative and you liked it. I gave a mixed uh, response to it. (laughs) Uh, And I see, because I wrote a little blog post on it, which we can include here, what I really uh, appreciate about it is, is Jared Leto as uh, the Joker. Yes, yeah, so you were the one who liked Jared Leto as the Joker. Uh, well, was I the only one? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, everyone else is wrong. Um, it, was, it was very widely considered to be an absolute mess. Um, and there were all these stories about it being recut by the company that did the trailer for it. And how true some of these are. But it did kind of speak to a messy production. Its sequel, well, its kind of spin-off was Birds of Prey. Uh, which was the Harley Quinn movie, which we saw together. Which women really liked. I was really surprised by that. And there were things that you know we really didn't pick up on, them, but uh, we didn't really have a very good time in it. Mm. But it wasn't entirely aimed at us, really. Um, this is more aimed at us. So this is The Suicide Squad, which is the first kind of flat-out sequel, I suppose. Although it doesn't really play as... It, it doesn't play as a continuation of the story of either of the films. It's no. just another episode in the adventures of this group. Yes. And a lot of the group is different as well. Characters are different. There are some that return and some that return and uh, perish. Yeah. Margot Robbie is clearly um, structured in as the star of the film. She's given a big star entrance. Yeah. Um, and a big star role. She's kind of separate to everything else. So yeah. I suppose spoiler territory will be coming up. She's part of this first wave that is sent into invade this um, island and she's the only surviving member of it um, actually she and Flag the other guy who was in the first film and then the other team which is most of the film which is Idris Elba the shark guy a couple of others they are the main team that you follow and they kind of meet up so yes. they, so she's separate and involved but I do think actually the film does balance the the, the, uh, the characters quite well I think so too I mean I think everyone has given their bit and she's supported by a whole bunch of Kind of B grade hunks, really. Yeah, B grade. <laughs> no, B grade stars, A list hunks. Yeah, they're very hunky, but they're not quite, you know, at the top tier of stardom. So Joel Kinnaman, uh, John Cena, Idris Elba. Mm. Yeah. What I would say, and you may well disagree with this because we don't really think very much of Idris Elba on this podcast, but I think this is the best I've seen him in a film. I loved him. I think yeah. he's really good in this. I and think he he's suits really, really it good. and he plays it right. That's right. Um, and the other two, I mean, they're given action sequences, but they're actually not given much to play. No. Right, whereas he is. Yeah, so he's, you know, he's very charming. He's given emotions to play. He's given lots of action to do. He comes off, I think, the best of the lot, really. And Margot Robbie, who I think is wonderful. Mm. Um, I think she's given too much comedy that just doesn't work, though. And I'm not sure it's entirely her fault. In fact, I don't really think it is. I think there's... There's quite a lot of jokes in the film that just don't land. Everything falls flat. And she's responsible for a lot of them because she's the kooky, mad character. Um, it's not her fault, though. No. I think she plays it really well. I just think it's so leaden. I mean, mm. you know, I think I laughed maybe twice. Yeah, I did laugh a few times. There are, there are things that work. And, I mean, in a film this long and this devoted to trying to make you laugh, it would be really ridiculous if nothing worked. But a lot of stuff very, really falls flat. I think two laughs in two hours in what is meant to be like an action comedy is too little. Mm. I kind of, you know, I was very admiring of many things, actually, of, you know, the production and, uh, you know, the, uh, the use of color and, you know, the kind of Godzilla type thing with the star and, yeah, and the way that it looked really poppy. and The starfish. Uh, the Star-o. starfish, the, the use of animation you know, with the shark. I mean, there, you know, there's a lot of, like, really interesting things in it. But I must say, I was dying for the film to be finished. Yeah. yeah. It, it grew on me, I have to say. I mean, I didn't expect very much. And I should say that, even though I say the first one went down like a ton of bricks, it made a lot of money. It made, like, $750 million. So, you know, it's just, you'll be re- rewriting history to say it was just completely dead. No, it was, like, the 10th highest-grossing film that year. Mm. 
this has lots of good bits that I like. Has lots of bits. I, I like the design of the big alien at the end, right? The starfish, Starro, its name is. Mm. You know, I like it as you say. It's poppy. It's got this big eye in it. Like it's cartoony. It has a sense of humour. It, it's it wants to be wacky and silly. And the, and then in that sense, all the really heavy gore that you get is it fits in with that. It's cartoonily heavy. Mm. You know, but I it also does come across. I must say the gore and the swearing. As it comes across as though they were really trying as hard as they could to get an 18 rating, and it's still only a 15. The BBFC weren't impressed. They were like, "This is just immature." Yeah. If it had some sex in it, they would have. But they're very scared. Well, they had some full frontal male nudity, which I thought, "What is that doing in this film?" Like, you know. Yeah, but it was some extra getting shot. It was a joke, kind of full frontal nudity. You know, it wasn't. It wasn't the sex. No, that would have been Um, so really ramped up the uh, the rating. I found it really leaden, I must say. And I kind of... I mean, there were a lot of things that I th- I thought were just misjudged. So, um, the whole rat thing, for me, it was like, ugh. What, what's wrong with it? Well, I mean, the film makes it into something, right? If the most despised and low, you know, the uh, animal in the world has a purpose, you know, so do we. But really, I just found it like... Uh, you know, I find rats disgusting, uh, <laughs> and yeah, it's a, I have a visceral response to them. And you know, making such a major part of the film, rats, and trying to make the rat lovable, like you know, it worked in Ratatouille up to a point, but it doesn't work here for me. I like rats, <laughs> and my brother used to keep rats. Yes, they're really friendly, lovely, sweet things. No one believes it until you actually show them a rat. And they go, actually, they're lovely. Because they're, they're, they're really nice rats. I wouldn't, like, befriend a street rat, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but I don't have that response to rats. But I can understand what people do. And that's what Idris Elba's character does the whole time. And then the very final shot of the film is him making friends with the rat. He overcomes. That's lovely. Yes, well, I didn't, I, it didn't work on me. <laughs> oh, it's lovely. I thought it was very misjudged. Because, you know, to make a major character in the narrative, mm. yeah, to be the controller of rats... You know, was always petting rats and was always remembering fond things about rats and so on. It's really asking a lot of the audience, who I, I, I suspect are a lot more like me than like you. So, Maybe it is, but I don't know. I think you go with it. And I think, I think the film is... The, the film would probably like to describe itself as irreverent. And a lot of that irreverence is in the jokes that fall quite flat. But maybe that kind of character uh, design is part of it, you know. Ugh. Get on to this, you fuckers. This girl likes rats and you will too. I, well, I didn't. Um, and, and I didn't like much else about the film. I thought it bordered on racist. Mm. You know, like the whole Latin America thing. You know, and the way that kind of, you know, people were depicted. Well, let's interact- briefly say what the context is for this. Is that the Suicide Squad have been told to go to this... It's a fictional South American island where there is this Project Starfish, which it turns out is this giant starfish that they have to fight at the end of the film. And it's this American project, you realise, and the reason that they're there is to keep everything under wraps and stop it getting out and keep the American secret for them. Mm. Keep, you know, keep the world from knowing that America was involved in this, that they farm this project off to this South American island. Mm. And on the way there, they uh, have to pick up Flag, who was lost in the earlier mission. He's been captured, so they think. And so they slaughter all of these South Americans, people who, you know, in this camp, silently, you know, without speaking to them, without really engaging in a fight. They do it very efficiently. And then they get there, and they, what they learn is that actually these guys are on their side. These are freedom fighters. They oppose the government, and the flag is getting on with them. And so the film is ultimately undercutting what you've just seen. But it is horrible when you're watching it. And I'm thinking, you know, this is just, this is, this is imperialist, right? The film does have this thing about imperialism and trying to undercut it. So John Cena's character is super America, mm. and he and he's this he has the irony built into him. His name is the Peacemaker, and he goes, "I will kill as many people as it takes to keep the peace," which is such a clear down the line satire of mm. American foreign policy. Yes, <laughs> you know, so you can see what they're going for, but on the way to doing it. You do sit through all this unpleasantness. Yeah. They're trying to be satiric and ironical and undercutting it, but then they're also reproducing that which they are trying to undercut. Yeah, exactly. So, and it's very unpleasant to see, you know, so they they kill, 
you know, a whole campsite of freedom fighters. And they go, oops. And actually, it's not funny. It doesn't work. Yeah, right. and it, but even when you didn't know they were freedom fighters, even when you thought these are the enemy and they have to free flag from these guys, it still wasn't pleasant then. It no, didn't feel justified enough at that point. Uh, true, but it made it all the worse when you realise. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so as opposed, and I, I think as opposed to making it a joke. I mean, it is meant to be a joke, but it, it really fell super flat. That one it does. <laughs> um, there's something wrong about the rhythms of the film. Because you can see how a lot of those jokes could work or might work, mm. and yet they don't, or at least they didn't on me, right? Mm. Um, and I think a lot of it had to do with the rhythms, with the timing of the thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the timing gets makes the jokes go flat, right? And this is where I was getting at a little bit with Margot Robbie's performance, because I think she's great, right? And I think she does all that you can expect an actress to do in that role, right? But there's something about the way that it's cut together, just about the timing of the thing, about, Mm. you know, how the next scene kind of, you know, goes into her response that undermines the joke, or that doesn't land the joke. Mm. And I think it has to do with the rhythms of the thing. Yeah, maybe. I mean, it didn't occur to me that timing was an issue, but it just occurred to me that writing was, that I just didn't share this film's sense of humour in many ways. And actually, it's, it's kind of broader tone I really didn't mind you know that sense like I was saying of cartoonishness this overarching silliness to it where the alien is this big colorful starfish you know it's quite silly um so that's where I got on with it but just the execution of almost everything landed badly with me me too um I didn't actually I mentioned to you at one point towards the end when they're fighting the thing it's when Idris Elba's shooting at it I was going like the audio from this has to be bleeding into the cinema next door. Mm. It's so loud. And I was thinking, have I seen a film that's louder than this? And I think, I've seen films equally as loud, right? There are films that just max out yeah. the sound. But there's no film that does it as relentlessly. It's just, it's extended. You know, there are films that will get that loud for a bit. But this, with the guitars going underneath, duh, 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 super, super, super loud. Now, that's not necessarily a criticism. I didn't mind that. I quite like, you know, <laughs> I didn't mind the sort of, um, the excess, I suppose. But it didn't. It it felt like it was, it felt like it was doing that in sort of in lieu of being a bit more exciting. Well, maybe because for me, the only thing that I truly loved about the film, that I thought really worked well, was the music. Yeah, and lots of good music choices. Yeah, lots of good music choices, and also kind of very well deployed. Yeah, that mm. you you can see the rationale for this particular piece of music in this particular scene. Um, so you know, that's the only thing that I loved. Uh, in an unqualified uh, way about the film, so you know there might uh, maybe the reason for amping everything up is to obliterate everything else that is so wrong with the film. <laughs> and actually, I do think the film is tone deaf in many ways. So, for example, one of the things that for me kind of doesn't land. They try to make a joke out of John Cena's body, right? He's like really built, and they have him in skimpy underwear, and mm. you know. They're shooting him from below, right? And yeah, they tried to get a joke out of it, and it and it fails. Yeah, or at least it didn't work with me. Mm. Um, and there's a lot of um, display of male bodies, but in a in a in an odd way. So, for example, you know, I ha- we have seen John Cena in the Fast and the Furious, and you know, and he's he's a very likable person. He's very charming, and so on. And of course, he's got yeah, immense muscles and he's mm. very fit and so on. But actually, what this film draws attention to you is actually how ugly his arms are. <laughs> yeah, that he's got like varicose veins all over his arms, right? Like, you know, they're huge veins and, mm. you know, they go in, in like very unattractive circles and it's like a little spider web of like, yeah. you know, popped out veins. And you think, yeah, I mean, you know, anybody who's edited this film will have noticed all of that. Right, like you know, why are they showing this to you? What's yeah, mm. the kind of um, yeah. I must say that didn't occur to me. I mean, I'm sure you're right. I just I never even thought um, maybe there's something off. I mean, I, well, it's impossible inter- to comment. I, I, it's interesting that it, they didn't occur to you, and maybe the reason for those choices is so that it wouldn't occur to heterosexual men, <laughs> right? Yeah. But this is a film with lots of display of male flesh. Yeah, Joel Kinnaman has his shirt off through half the film, mm. right? And uh, uh, so does John Cena, really. 
It's true. Come think of it, because um, I mean that would that would have occurred to me, and probably did occur to me in Fast and Furious films like that. There are really bloke he machismo mm. showing off. This isn't like that. No, doesn't have that tone. So I don't know. You're right. The people did have their shirts off a fair bit. <laughs> yeah, more than a fair bit. But like, uh, but I didn't uh, feel. Um, Draw, like in Fast and Furious, I'm drawn to looking at the bodies. They're being so displayed for me. Well, it didn't feel like that here. Oh gosh, well I think you you must have missed the boat because yeah. if you remember the scene where Luna, yeah, yeah, so Harley Quinn goes into mm-hmm, the yeah. palace, right, and how are we introduced to the oh, Luna yeah, yeah, character? Yeah. He comes out of the bath, right, and he's completely ripped. Yeah, yeah, you know, and right. like you know, so um, that's true. You know, and yet. It does feel like showing them off for beauty more than for machismo. No, no, definitely. Yeah. You know, uh, though then I th- I'm thinking if it's showing it off, you know, for a kind of, de- you know, to, to make the audience desire or whatever, to incite desire, then why follow it up with the other choice? So, for example, the Luna character, he's introduced like Venus coming out of the bathtub in a way. Mm. But then when he's filmed in the sex scene with Harley Quinn, like you see all the lines in the face, yeah. That kind mm. of not enough attention has been paid. If the intention is to incite desire and to make it beautiful, the film fails, yeah, because you're noticing like you know, mm. uh, uh, yeah, lines and you know imperfections. And like I said, with John Cena, those immense <laughs> veins that he's got in his forearms, right, that really do look like varicose veins in the arm rather than you know. Uh, so, anyway, I thought that was kind of misjudged yeah. and odd. Uh, when I think of uh, you know a big veiny arms, I think of Sylvester Stallone, who is in this, but he does the voice of the shark guy. But you know, I think of his because his are like steroid abused. Uh, you know, you see him in the in the Expendable films. Yes. Yeah, you know, he's like he's he seems like a properly broken physical specimen. You know, <laughs> whereas John Cena, I think, still looks all right. Well. <laughs> I think um, it was. It wasn't just that he had these big veins. It was also the way that they manifest themselves in the forearms. It wasn't just like a line, yeah, going yeah. down the arm. It was like, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so I found it like repulsive. Uh, <laughs> I'll, have, I'll have to have a look when it comes out on uh, on streaming because I'm not going to go to the cinema to see it again. Yeah. You know. Because despite everything, it was all right. I I felt diverted enough throughout. I didn't feel. So bored by anything or anything. I, I thought I, I thought bored. it was the best Suicide Squad film so far, but the bar is not high. Oh, well, I um, was bored and I couldn't wait for it to end. Yeah, I sort of didn't mind it, but I couldn't recommend it. God. All right. Well, thank you very much for listening. We're eavesdropping at the movies, and we are on Apple Podcasts, uh, Audible. I just found out we're on mm. Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and YouTube. On social media, we're on Facebook and Twitter uh, at Eavesdrop Movies. And the website is eavesdroppingatthemovies.com. Thank you very much for listening. Bye-bye.